You know how Fox News and CNN makes their money? They sell your eyeballs to advertisers. You know how Facebook makes their money? They sell your eyeballs to advertisers. So all media is potentially distraction. It's all potentially very good and a form of traction if it's what you say you're going to do. So I, I you know, we, we need to get off of this like, oh, it's addicting everybody. It's melting our brains. It's stealing our attention. It's not stealing your attention. You're giving them your attention. You're willfully giving it over. Oh, but it's so engaging and I like it so much. And the algorithms are melting my brain. Give me a break. All right, billion dollar movers. This is a special episode that I think you all will love. And I know I say this every week, but hey, our guest list is always popping. Thanks to all of you tuning in. Now, today's guest is Nur Eyal, a behavioral design expert who taught at Stanford's Graduate School of Business. He is the author of the best-selling book, Hooked, which sold over a quarter million copies and is a Silicon Valley must read. Nur's new book, Indistractable, How to Control Your Attention and Choose Your Life, has won several awards. We talk about how to create products that are habit-forming such that it creates a level of skill and user stickiness we all care about, why we're not actually addicted to our phones and why saying so is hurting us, Nerd challenges my vision boarding belief, and we chat about how to take back our focus from the distractions holding us back from living the kind of life we know we're capable of. As always, you don't want to miss this. A lot to cover today. Uh, you know, you, you've really published two amazing books that I see right behind you. Excellent strategic positioning, a trigger that I think for people <laughs> later on to take action. Uh, so, you, you know, you're talking to a little bit of a nerd nerd here. Uh, but tell us a little bit, give us a little bit of a context framing. Who is nerd? What brought you to this work of behavioral design? And what do you actually do on a day to day basis these days? Sure. So I'm a behavioral designer. I blog at nearandfar.com. So near, like my first name, N-I-R and far.com. And uh, I've been doing that for several years. Uh, professionally, I'm what you call a behavioral designer. So I help companies build healthy habits with their technology products. So I work in every conceivable industry that requires repeat engagement. So healthcare, uh, um, uh, fitness products, um, ed tech products, fintech products, anything that requires repeat habitual engagement. That's where I focus my, my time and effort. Uh, and my research that I use with my clients there uh, came out of my book, Hooked, How to Build Habit-Forming Products, which itself came out of a class that I taught at the Stanford Graduate School of Business and later at the Hassel Platter Institute of Design. And then more recently, I published a book on the other side, which is called Indistractable, How to Control Your Attention and Choose Your Life. So Hooked was about how to build habit-forming products to build healthy habits in users' lives. Indistractable is not written for makers, it's written for everyone uh, who struggles with distraction. So the idea is that we can build healthy habits with certain products, right? We want to build healthy habits with, you know, learning a new language app or a fitness app or an app that helps us save money. We want to get hooked to those products, but then we also want to disconnect from the products that might uh, uh, leave us with regret, like drinking too much, watching too much television, consuming too much news, uh, spending too much time on social media, anything that might distract us from living the kind of life we know we are capable of living. Yeah. And, and, you know, I want to dig a little bit deeper here. You know, I, I'm always curious. I've, I have a couple of friends, uh, including Greg McCowan, who, who wrote about essentialism and, you know, what got him on that journey was fascinating. I'd love to hear a little bit about your story. You know, you started teaching at Stanford, but obviously uh, this all came from somewhere, right? Did you actually grow up thinking, hmm, I want to be talking about behavior design? Uh, I mean, back then it, it wasn't as commonplace as it is today. How did you find that? Yeah, so I was always fascinated by how products change behavior. And I think the, the, the inspiration for that, the spark, was that I grew up uh, clinically obese uh, and not just chubby. I remember my mom taking me to the doctor and the doctor showing me this chart on the wall that had like this green zone, this yellow zone, and the red zone. And he says, okay, here's you on this chart. You're in this red zone. You're obese. And uh, I remember feeling like food controlled me. And... Um, you know, in the eighties, we didn't, we didn't know, <laughs> right? Like, uh, the stuff we used to eat as kids, you know, it just makes my teeth hurt thinking about it. Um, but I remember feeling like, like, you know, food controlled me and that, and that the tactics that many food companies were using, the more I learned about how they were using these tactics, it became fascinating, uh, both in the way that it, um, 
it changes behavior and at times how manipulative it can be. And I think we still see many of these techniques today used by, by food companies. And so uh, it wasn't, until, but there's, a, there's the, the next step was that I actually, you know, felt like I got control over my weight and that uh, really changed my life in so many ways, principally because I was very, I feel very fortunate uh, you know, many of my, my member, many members of my family still struggle with their weight. I still struggle with my weight, but today I'm in the best shape of my life at 45 years old. And it, it was because I figured out how to empower myself through that challenge um, by acknowledging that uh, my weight wasn't my fault. Okay, there are many interests that uh, uh, that I didn't account for. Things in my environment, how I was raised, what we used to eat back then, the food companies, manipulative practices. But even though it wasn't my fault, it was my responsibility because nobody was going to take responsibility of it for me. And so it was because of that process and how I eventually learned to lose weight and uh, you know, still, still am mindful of it today that I became fascinated with both sides. One, how do you change user behavior for good? Like how can we steal these tactics from the advertising companies, from the gaming companies, uh, from the social media companies? How can we steal those tactics to help people build healthy habits in their lives, right? What if we used a language learning app or a fitness app as voraciously as we check TikTok and Instagram? That was kind of the idea behind my first book. And then also how can we as consumers make sure that we spend our time and attention, the most valuable resources we have in a way that uh, leaves us fulfilled as opposed to uh, regretful of, of, of bad decisions. Wow, thanks for sharing that. And and when you think about how long it took you to formulate, I mean, essentially what you've built is their, their frameworks, right? Excellent frameworks for us to think about um, how to achieve these things. But how long did it take you to sort of uh, put pieces together Mm. So um, it took me about five years to write each book. Uh, my last book, wow. Indistractable, took about five years because I kept getting distracted. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so the, years the author because... himself is not free from distraction. Good to hear. Well, Good to well, hear that. I... <laughs> Well, the thing is, I don't write books the way most authors do. Most authors write books because they know something. I write books because I want to know something. I mean, as much as I love my readers and I get emails every day from people thanking me about what a big impact the books have had, which is fantastic, but that's icing on the cake. I write books that I myself need. <laughs> and when I can't find uh, the solution to the problem in somebody else's book, I need to do my own research to fix the problem. So when I had this problem of distraction, I read many books on the topic. And they all said the same stupid thing, you know, stop using email, stop using your phone, just say no to people when they want things. When your boss asks for something, just say no. It's the kind of advice that a tenured professor would give. It's stupid advice. For the vast majority of people, they can't do that. If you say no to your boss, you're going to get fired. If you stop using email and social media, you probably won't have a job for long. So it's really not practical advice. What I wanted was to find how I could keep using these tools. I mean, these technology tools are so powerful, but how I could use them in a way that served me as opposed to me serving the tools. And so that's why I wanted a tech positive approach. Uh, that's not about abstinence. We know abstinence, it doesn't work. It doesn't work for, for, for most people. Uh, it's not a good strategy. In fact, it makes them want these things more. And so I really want to dive into the research because there's so much bad productivity advice out there that isn't supported by solid research. So I did the research for four years to educate myself on what is in the scientific literature. And that took a long time. But then once I discovered what really makes a difference and started applying it to my life today, I'm indistractable. Back then I wasn't because I didn't know the techniques. You know, I, I was following stupid productivity advice, like keep a to-do list, which by the way, we can talk about later why to-do lists mm. are one of the worst things you can do for your personal productivity. So the point is the reason it took me so long is that I didn't know these techniques. But once I learned these techniques, these four essential practices to becoming indistractable, today my life is, is better than ever, right? I spend more quality time with my family than ever. I'm more productive at work than ever. I'm in better physical shape than I have ever been in my life. And so there's no error in my life. My physical health, my mental health is, is, is all have all been impacted because I'm finally indistractable. Hey, hey, by now, you know that Billion Dollar Moves is proud to be part of the HubSpot Podcast Network, the audio destination for business professionals. Together with other amazing podcasts like Techish, hosted by Abedesi Usunsade and Michael Burheen, a podcast by two millennials talking about all things tech, pop culture and life. What is there not to like? And I recommend this episode, Founders Corner, How to Not Get Cancelled as a Founder, where these two break down how to manage the fear of getting cancelled very real today and how to stay grounded as you skill. You don't want to miss it. Listen to Techish wherever you get your podcasts. 
And uh, before we go into to the crux of it, which which I'm dying to do, uh, you moved to Singapore, and and I think I spotted you um, actually with one of our partner fund endeavor as well. And you were speaking to some endeavor entrepreneurs, I believe, in New York. Uh, so you moved from New York uh, from to SF, and then Singapore. Tell us a little bit about why you did that. So we came out here temporarily, and then we fell in love with it. Uh, Singapore is just a really, really cool country. It's like living in the future. There are so many problems that uh, I thought growing up in America was just endemic, that there's nothing we can do about it. You know, homelessness is everywhere, and uh, crappy healthcare is just the way things are, and uh, infrastructure that's dirty and uh, doesn't run well, and, you know, cost of fortune is just the way things are. And I hate to tell you people, but it's not true. There's some countries that do a lot of things better than we do in America. I, I love America. I'm a very proud American citizen. Um, and uh, there's a lot of things we do really, really well. But there's also a bunch of things that we should learn from other countries on how well they do it. And in many ways, living in Singapore is like living in the future. Um, and so as a quality of life perspective, uh, we're treated really well here. Like life is really, really good. Uh, so I, I encourage everybody, actually, if you haven't made it out to Singapore, uh, you definitely should. Uh, it's it's a country that has the you know the, a big advantage of the fact that it was restarted essentially in 1965, and they had a fantastic leader called Lee Kuan Yew, who I'm convinced if he was in charge of a bigger nation, uh, everybody would know his name. But because Singapore is such a tiny island with five and a half million people, most people have never heard the name Lee Kuan Yew. But he set up a government here that. Um, uh, because of his insights, uh, he was a very, very smart man who set up, you know, a government that has virtually no corruption, almost no crime in the country, no homelessness to speak of, very good health care, some of the best education in the world. I mean, uh, what's not to love? It's far. That's the only thing that, that is a shame <laughs> is that it's far from, from home. <laughs> Well, it's not so far for me, actually, growing up, I grew up in Malaysia, and then I, I started my career in Malaysia doing VC. And, and so a lot of our listeners actually are good friends within the region. And I thought, you know, it'd be good to also hear a little bit of your, your sense with the region and yeah. how that connects in terms of behavior, right? Uh, so let's talk yeah. about that. You decided, uh, Nur decided to go a little bit far. Uh, I know I, I'm just all full of bad jokes today. <laughs> uh, but let's talk a little bit about that. A lot of times we think that it is you know, this terrible behavior is because of the tools that we use, the technology, you know, social media, Facebook, and all of these things. But a lot of these inherent desires has been around for a very, very long time. So we don't actually have the tools to blame but ourselves. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Sure. So one of the things I learned when I started studying this field of distraction, I really want to start from first principles and starting with the history of distraction, right? Like when did people start feeling distracted? And so it turns out that the first recorded case of someone struggling with distraction comes to us from Plato, the Greek philosopher. 2,500 years ago, he described akrasia, the tendency to do things against our better interest. And so, you know, what that leads me to conclude is that it can't be a new problem, right? It's not something that was created just because of Facebook or TikTok or whatever latest distraction we seem to be struggling with. Distraction is part of the human condition. I mean, we have, you know, uh, historical records of, of monks hundreds of years ago talking about how distracting the world was because they couldn't focus on their, uh, you know, writing the Bible or, or you know, all the, all the um, you know, we have these pretty extensive historical records that show us that people have always struggled with distraction and always will struggle with distraction. But the, the good news is that if we understand what distraction is and its component parts, we can overcome it uh, by understanding the deeper psychology, the real reason, not the proximal cause. You know, people tend to blame whatever is the, the tech du jour, right? Uh, in my generation, they called us couch potatoes because we watch too much TV. Today, they say the kids are all addicted to video games. Uh, in my grandparents' generation, it was the radio. People bemoaned novels. Did you know novels were going to make women lascivious? Uh, that wow. The bicycle was a terrible invention. All these things were going to melt people's brains. Even the written word, Socrates talked about the written word being something that would enfeeble men's minds. So every new technology, we have this moral panic and we blame the technology when that is a proximal cause. Of course, it serves a role, but it's not the root cause. The root cause of the problem, of course, is our behavior. So tell us a little bit about that. When we get hooked on something, I mean, let's go through a little bit of the, the cheat sheet here on, on what you wrote with hooked. What are we looking for? 
So hooked is for product makers. So it's for people who are building the kind of products and services that need repeat engagement. So if you're building the kind of product that you want people to come back to, to build a healthy habit, uh, and you need them to come back on their own, then you need to use the principles in this book. It's not that every product needs to be habit forming. There's lots of products that don't need repeat engagement, right? If it's a one-time sale or infrequent sale, you don't need habits. But if you want people to come back to use your product because they want to, not because they have to, uh, or if you want to stop spending all that money on frivolous advertising, or spammy marketing, then you may need to figure out how to build a habit to bring people back. It's also a huge competitive advantage if you can build a habit, because when you build a habit uh, with your product, people don't even consider the competition, right? When was the last time you Googled something and said, hmm, I wonder who makes a better search engine? You don't do that. You don't even consider the competition once a habit is formed. And that becomes a very, very powerful uh, economic position. It's, it's what's called a competitive moat. Right. So there's many competitive modes. You can have economies of scale. You can have intellectual property. Uh, you can have network effects. But one of the best uh, competitive advantage is simply a habit. But it's not easy to form and it's pretty difficult to break once you've uh, built that habit with the customer. When we're hooked onto something, right? Um, a lot of times, I mean, people will say, oh, yeah, you're just you, you have ADHD. You're, uh, you know, you're you're actually being distracted by the phone. So putting the phone away might be the solution. But actually, we're, what you did say uh, in your book was a lot of it comes from our innate human desires to address discomfort in, in some way. Tell us a little bit more about that. Sure. Yeah. So the best place to start to understand distraction is to really start with the word, right? Where does the word even come from? What does it mean? Uh, and the best way to understand what the word means is to understand the antonym. What's the opposite of distraction? Most people will tell you the opposite of distraction is focus, but that's not exactly right. The opposite of distraction, if you look at the origin of the word, is not focus, it's traction. And when you say it, it makes total sense, right? Traction and distraction. Both words come from the same Latin root, trahare, which means to pull, and they both end in the same six letters, A-C-T-I-O-N, that spells action, which reminds us that distraction is not something that happens to us, rather it is an action that we ourselves take. So traction, by definition, is any action that pulls you towards what you say you're going to do, things that you do with intent, things that move you closer to your values, and help you become the kind of person you want to become. Those are acts of traction. The opposite of traction, distraction, is any action that pulls you further away from what you said you were going to do, further away from your values, further away from becoming the kind of person you want to become. Those are acts of distraction. Now, what separates traction and distraction is one word, and that one word is intent. So as Dorothy Parker said, the time you plan to waste is not wasted time. So we need to stop moralizing and medicalizing people's behavior and saying that, that somehow, you know, my, how I spend my time, that's okay, right? If I want to watch football on TV for whatever, God knows not how many number of hours, that's fine. Oh, but you playing video games, that's bad. Don't do that. Why? There's no difference. And we shouldn't judge others or ourselves based on the behavior itself. Rather, we should judge ourselves and others based on whether we are doing what we said we wanted to do. So if you say, I want to watch Netflix or play a video game or stare at the wall, it doesn't matter. If you do that with intent, if you do that with forethought, it's traction. Enjoy it. Don't guilt yourself out about it. Just book the time to make sure you spend your time and attention the way you want, according to your values, not someone else's, certainly not the tech companies. Now, conversely, just because something is a work-related task doesn't make it morally virtuous, right? Let me tell you my, my daily routine for years. It used to be, I would sit down at my desk, I'd get to work, and I would, uh, I, I would sit down at my desk and I'd look at my to-do list and I'd say, okay, and we could talk about, by the way, again, why to-do lists are so bad for your productivity. We can get back to that in a minute. And I'd say, oh, you know what? I've really got that big, important project that I've been delaying on. I, I, I gotta do that project. That's the first thing I'm gonna do. Okay, here I go. I'm gonna get started. Right now, nothing's going to get in my way. I'm not going to get distracted. Here I go. But first, let me check some email, right? Let me just scroll that Slack channel. Let me just do those other things on my to-do list, you know, just to get some momentum, just some easy tasks to check off some of those boxes, you know, just to get the ball rolling. Those are all work-related tasks. So what? I'm going to check email first. I got to check email at some point. That's all office type admin stuff. It's okay. But then, of course, you know what happens. 20, 30, 45 minutes later, maybe another day later, I still haven't done the thing I said I was going to do with my time and attention. So what happens is distraction, the most evil form of distraction is the kind that you don't even realize is happening. Because we say, well, it's a work-related task. Let me just check that email real quick. But what we don't realize is that this type of distraction tricks us 
into prioritizing the urgent and the easy work at the expense of the hard and important work we have to do to move our lives and careers forward. So now we have traction, we have distraction. Now let's talk about what prompts us to traction distraction. We have our triggers. There are two kinds of triggers. We have what we call external triggers. External triggers you'll be very familiar with. These are the pings, the dings, the rings, anything in our outside environment that tells us what to do, right? We see these every day, but here's the kicker. Only 10% of the time that we get distracted, 10%, studies have found this, okay? 10% of the time that we get distracted, is it because of an external trigger? 10%, okay? It's a cause, but it's only 10% of the cause. The other 90% of the time that we get distracted, 90% is not because of what's happening outside of us. But what I learned in my five years of research is that by and large, the vast majority of distractions begin from within. These are called internal triggers. Internal triggers, are uncomfortable emotional states that we seek to escape. Boredom, loneliness, fatigue, uncertainty, anxiety, stress, these uncomfortable sensations that we seek to escape from with distraction. So here's the most important point of my research over the past five years now that I worked on this book, is that if you don't understand the deeper reason why you're getting distracted, if you can't articulate that sensation that you are trying to escape from, I don't care if it's too much news, too much booze, too much football, too, too much Facebook. You will always find some kind of solution to that discomfort. You're always going to find a distraction unless you know how to deal with that discomfort in a healthy way. So the first step to becoming indistractable is to master those internal triggers or they will become your master. That's step number one. Step number two, making time for traction. Step number three, hacking back those external triggers. And then finally, step number four, preventing distraction with pacts. And it's by using these four steps in concert, anyone can become indistractable. Yeah. And well, we need to talk about this to-do list. Is that not part of taking action? What's wrong with the to-do list? So the pro there's a many problems with to-do lists. Uh, one is that the, 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 the research doesn't really verify it's a very good technique, but we do know that there is a much, much better technique, and we'll get to that in a minute. The big problem with to-do lists, there are several. One of the big problems with to-do lists is that they have no constraints, okay? There's no constraints. So when you put stuff on your to-do list, you can always add more and more and more and more and more, right? So here's what happens. It's called the tyranny of the to-do list. You get home from work, you've been working all day, you're running ragged, you checked off all these boxes on your to-do list and what happens, you, you take a look at that to-do list at the end of the day and you still have more stuff to do, right? And so all these things that you said you were going to do because there was no constraint reinforces this self-image of someone who doesn't do what they say they're going to do, loser. Mm. And so what you begin to believe is this nonsense that you hear people saying all the time of, oh, I'm no good at time management, or I have a short attention span, whatever it is they say, and they think they're somehow broken. You're not broken. It's a stupid technique we use that's broken. So there's nothing wrong with getting stuff out of your head and putting it on a piece of paper or an app. That's fine. But that's not the end all be all. The problem is if you run your life on a to-do list, if you wake up every morning and say, mm, what am I supposed to do today? And the first place you go is your to-do list you've already lost. Where you should be looking is not your to-do list, it's your calendar. Because this technique has been validated in thousands of peer-reviewed studies. This technique is called time boxing. And it uses what psychologists call setting an implementation intention, which is just a fancy way of saying, planning out what you're going to do and when you're going to do it. So the, what, the, the paradigm shift I want people to make is to start changing their minds from measuring themselves by how many stupid little boxes they checked off. That is the wrong metric. The right metric is one thing and one thing only. Did I do what I said I was going to do for as long as I said I would without distraction? That's it. That's it. That when you put time on your calendar to do the things you have to do, you are forced to make constraint or you're forced to make trade-offs because of the constraint of the fact that we all have the same 24 hours in a day. So you have to decide what your priorities are, unlike a to-do list that has no constraints. So when you do that, when you measure yourself by not finishing anything, I didn't say finish. I said measuring yourself by whether you did what you said you were going to do for as long as you said you would without distraction. It doesn't matter if you finish. And when you do that, here's the kicker. You learn how long things take you. If you just use a to-do list, 
this is what happens. You work on something for five minutes. It's a little bit difficult to sort of say, I'm going to just check email real quick. And, oh, you know, Jimmy stopped by my desk and wants those, you know, the TPS report. Uh, and then I'm going to get back to that task for another five minutes. And then, oh, you know what? There's that thing I need to do. So let me just do that. And you know what? I kind of need a cup of coffee. Let me just go do that. And you have no idea how much progress you make per minute. With a time box calendar, when you said, I'm going to work on this task for just 30 minutes, that's it. Yeah, you know what? 10 minutes, okay? You can do pretty much anything for just 10 minutes. If you say, I'm going to work on this task for just 10 minutes, and then I'm going to see how much progress I made. So if in 10 minutes, I say, oh, you know what? Uh, you know, I, I need to make a presentation of uh, uh, an hour, and you know what? I made three slides. Okay, well, now I can do the math and figure out how many more time boxes I need to finish the task. Show me how you have that kind of feedback loop when it comes to a to-do list. It doesn't exist. So when you measure yourself, and studies have verified this, when you measure yourself, by whether you did what you said you were going to do, not finish, but whether you just worked on what you said you were going to work on for as long as you said you would without distraction, people who do that actually finish more. They get more done than the people who use the antiquated to-do list technique. And the final thing about why to-do lists suck is that even when people have time off, okay, they come home from work, you just want to be with your kids, you just want to relax, uh, you want to play a video game, or I don't know, read the news. What happens is if you keep this to-do list of undone tasks, what happens is, and I, this used to happen to me all the time, I would always be thinking about all the stuff I would still haven't done. And so even when I want to relax, I can't because I'm thinking about all the stuff I have to do tomorrow or the stuff that I, I should do after my kid goes to bed, right? So even the leisure time you don't get to enjoy, whereas now I have time on my schedule to go on social media or to watch Netflix or whatever it is I want to do, it's on my schedule. And now I've turned distraction into traction by putting it on my calendar. And if I do anything else, that would then be a distraction. So there's many, many reasons why uh, a, a time box calendar eats a to-do list for breakfast. Mm, I love this. I love this a lot because I do a little bit of both, but I am guilty of all that you've said there, you know, stay, you know, keeping waking up at night in the middle of the night because I have this long list that I, I, I'm anxious about and it does not help at all. But I'm staring yeah. here Whereas at when, it. By the way, was... when you put it on your calendar, you don't have to keep worrying about, oh, when am I going to get to it? When am I going to get to it? You know when you're going to get to it. It's on your calendar at a certain time and date. Yeah. So I'm curious. So tactically here, if I go into Nuriel's calendar, is it basically every hour that's felt like, do you actually spend time like in the beginning of the week to time block everything? What, what's your technique here? Right, right. So every Sunday night at 8 p.m. is my time to sit down and I review my schedule that just passed. I review my week that, that just passed and I try and find ways to make it easier to follow. So the idea is that you don't set it once and forget it. You can continue to revise. And by the way, if you need a template for this, if you go to my website nearandfar.com forward slash schedule hyphen maker, again, that's nearandfar.com forward slash hyphen. Uh, forward slash schedule hyphen maker. There's a free tool you can download. People kept asking me, well, how do I do it? How do I do it? There's a template there that will take you step by step on how to do this. Very, very simple. It's totally free, by the way. But essentially what you're going to do is you're going to make a schedule for yourself based on your values. What are values? Values are attributes of the person you want to become. I'll say that again. Vat values are attributes of the person you want to become. If you want to know what someone's values really are, not what they say, but what they actually are, you look in two places. You look at how they spend their money and how they spend their time, okay? And I would say how you spend your time is even more important than how you spend your money because you can always make more money, right? People are so cheap with their money, right? We click coupons, we split checks, we think about, oh, how much are we going to give to this charity or that charity? But that's silly, right? We're so cheap with our money, but we can always make more money. You cannot make more time. But when we spend our time, oh, yeah, sure. Oh, there's that uh, TV show that everybody's talking about. Well, I guess I'll give that my time. And Oh, my, my kids need this and my boss needs that and my friend wants this. And did you see what happened on Twitter? Oh, my God. We give so much time away and we should be stingy with our time and generous with our money because, again, we can't make more time. We can always make more money. But essentially what you're doing when you make this time box calendar is to sit down and ask yourself, what are your values in three life domains? Okay, The first life domain is you. If you can't take care of yourself, can't take care of your family, can't take, can't make the world a better place, you have to take care of yourself first. What does that look like? Well, ask yourself, how would the person I want to become spend time taking care of themselves? And by the way, this isn't you know someone else's values. It's not how should I or could I or guilting yourself into doing one thing or another, but ask yourself, how much time would the person I want to become spend taking care of themselves? So if physical health is important, you ask people, oh, what are your values? What's important to you? Oh, health is very, very important. Yeah, 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 health is important. Okay, 
well, do you have time for sleep? Do you have a bedtime? Let me tell you, I used to tell my daughter for years, got to get to bed. You need your rest. It's past bedtime. And then she asked me one day, she says, daddy, when's your bedtime? And I couldn't tell her because I was a damn hypocrite, right? I didn't have a bedtime. We all know sleep is important. We've all read the books. Yes, yes, sleep is important. But why don't we have bedtimes? We need a bedtime. <laughs> it's important for our psychological well-being. You know, if you if you look at uh, you know the effect of on mental health and, and sleep, there's a one-to-one -one relationship. You have to get proper rest. How about uh, time for exercise? People say, oh yeah, yeah, this is the year I'm going to get in shape, but they don't put the time to exercise on their schedule. Uh, reading books, oh yeah, I need to read more books. It's important to expand my mind. I'm going to take courses. Is it on your schedule? If it's not, it's not going to happen. So put that time in first. That's the first life domain. The second life domain is the relationship domain. Part of the reason we are experiencing a loneliness epidemic in the industrialized world is that the institutions that we used to have, the church groups, uh, the, the Kiwanis Club, the, the local civic organizations, those institutions have broken down. We, we're not, at, you know, the society is more secular these days. We don't have those regular interactions with other people. We need them in our lives. So put that time in your schedule. Don't give your family and friends whatever leftovers you have. If people are important to you in your life, make time for them. Put it on your schedule in advance. Then finally, the work domain. And this is where people start, but I actually think this is the one that should come last. So the work domain, you can split up into two kinds of work. The two kinds of work are reflective work and reactive work. Reactive work is the kind of work we're all familiar with, right? Reacting to messages, reacting to notifications, reacting to meetings, reacting to phone calls. Everybody has some portion of their day spent doing reactive work. The problem is people get very comfortable doing reactive work. Why? Because people don't like to ask themselves, what are my priorities? It's a tough question to ask yourself what's important. So instead of actually asking yourself that tough question, we get into this zone, this, the, this mindless space of, well, I'll just let my email tell me what to do. I'll let people, God forbid you should do this. Please don't do this. I'll just give people access to my calendar. They can just book meetings whenever they want. I have an open door policy. Sure. Yeah. Just come see me whenever. If you're doing that, you are shooting yourself in the foot and you're shooting your career in the foot because you're letting other people guide your time, your attention, your priorities, and your life. Stop it. Sometime in your day, of course, you have to spend being available to others. You need time to do reactive work, certainly. But don't get into this lull of letting your entire day spent doing reactive work because you're being intellectually lazy. You have to put time in your day for reflective work. Reflective work is the kind of work that can only be done without distraction. Planning, strategizing, being creative, thinking for God's sakes. You wanna be better than 99% of people in your industry? Make time to think, because I promise you, 99% of people in your industry don't do it. They just react all day long and they don't sit down and think. So put that time in your calendar. Even if it's 20, 30 minutes, fine. You must have some time in your day for reflective work. And when you follow that process using these three, uh, the, the, these three life domains of you, your relationships, and your work, this is how you build out that calendar. And then once you built it for the week, you stick with it. Now, are you going to fall off track? Absolutely, 100%, you will fall off track. The beauty is for the first time, you will know what is the difference between traction, everything that is in your schedule, and distraction, everything else. Because remember, you can't call something a distraction unless you know what it distracted you from. How can you possibly say you got distracted if you don't know what it is that you said you were gonna spend your time on? That's the only way you can say you got distracted. If you've got white space, you did not get distracted because what did you get distracted from? It's time to get out of spreadsheets. With HubSpot CRM, get real-time data at your fingertips so your team stay in sync across the customer journey. Track your contacts and customers, send personalized emails in bulk, and get the context you need to create amazing experiences for your teams and your customers at scale, all from one powerful platform. It's why more than 150,000 companies already use HubSpot CRM to run their businesses better. Plus, HubSpot's user-friendly interface sets you up for success from day one so you can spend less time managing software and more time on what matters, your customers. There's no better time to get organized Learn how HubSpot can help your business grow better and get a special offer of 20% off on eligible plans at hubspot.com slash billion dollar moves.
I love so much of this. Uh, and I'm so tempted to ask you this one question because I'm, I'm uh, turning to my right here, looking at my vision board. And I've been taught since 12 uh, or even younger than that. My parents have, uh, I mean, parenting is a whole different topic. And I know you have uh, a daughter that keeps you in check as well. So this is all uh, a lot to talk about. But do you believe in goal setting? Do you believe in the vision board technique? Does this, how does it fit into uh, what you talk about here? Yeah, um, not really. <laughs> and mm. I'll tell you why. So the problem with vision boarding, and this isn't this isn't my research, but there is some very fascinating research about how when you have a vision board that's based on outcomes, okay, outcomes, the typical way that people do vision boards is, you know, I, I, I want a, a beach body. So I'm going to cut out a picture of a beautiful model in a bikini, and I'm going to put that on my vision board. I want wealth. So I'm going to take a picture of, uh, you know, in a magazine of someone in front of a Lamborghini, and I'm going to put that on my vision board. It's all outcome oriented. The problem with that is that when we do that, when we only think about the outcomes and that becomes what we vision, it gives us a little bit of preemptive joy, right? We feel kind of good thinking, oh, that's what I'm looking forward to. That's what I, and, and imagining it makes you feel good in the moment, which actually studies have found make you less motivated to actually do the things you need to do to get those goals. A much better way to, to, to vision things is not to vision the outcome. We know that these big goals are pointless if you don't fall in love with the process. You know what? If you, you know, I, I struggle with my weight my entire life. Today at 45 years old, I'm, I'm proud to tell you I have a six pack abs. I've never had six pack abs. And it's, is it because I have good genes? No, it's because for years I didn't vision my future. I didn't vision six pack abs. I went to the gym and I ate right for years. <laughs> okay. It doesn't just happen. You have to fall in love with the process, not the outcomes. So the right way to vision, there is a right way to vision. The right way to vision is to envision what you will do when something threatens to take you off track to your goal. That's the right way to vision. Let's say you're on a diet. Okay, let's say you want that beach body someday. The right thing to vision is not yourself on a beach in a bikini. The right thing to vision is what will you do? What you will you say? How will you feel? How will you, will you react? when someone offers you a piece of chocolate cake at a party. What are you gonna do? That's the right way to vision. You're trying to make money, right? You're trying to save up, okay? Maybe your spending is a little bit out of control and you wanna come in under budget. The right way is to not envision yourself in a big house and a fancy car. The right way is to ask yourself, what am I gonna do? Let me envision myself, I'm at the store and I'm tempted to buy something that I'll later regret. What script will go through my head so that I'm prepared to take on that temptation in a healthy way as opposed to succumbing to it. That's the right way to vision. Mm, okay. All right. Well, I will reconsider this, uh, but I, I agree with you, though. I, I'm a huge believer of the systems and, you know, um, sort of the Tim Ferriss, who else... Um, who else has, has talked about this? Um, uh, what's his everybody. name? Everybody. Everybody and their mother. Yeah, everybody. That's right. <laughs> so talking about systems here, now I want to shift. I know we, we've jumped a little bit, but it, I, I feel it's all connected. And, and I this is why I love uh, the body of work that you do, because it's, you know, it starts with the problem, right, which actually makers can take advantage of in some way. And I want to talk a little bit about technology and bring it closer to the founders and makers here. Uh, so these are all the things that we should be doing uh, to escape uh, certain things like social media. But tell us a little bit about this hooked um, element of, of design here and why social media has been so successful in capturing our attention and making us, quote unquote, distracted. Well, I don't think it's it's all bad. Uh, I think social media is a wonderful tool. You know, we only think about the bad stuff. But if you think about, um, you know, the Me Too movement, the Arab Spring, Black Lives Matter, uh, you know, there's a lot of things that are d disparate groups. You know, we know that teen suicide among LGBTQ youth is uh, falling dis uh, precipitously because it's able to connect people from disparate communities. Uh, so, you know, we only hear the bad news because guess who publishes the bad news? The, comp the competition, right? What's social media's competition? Well, the New York Times and the Atlantic and uh, Fox News, these people are in direct competition in the same business model, right? <laughs> like, the, you know how Fox News and CNN makes their money? They sell your eyeballs to advertisers. You know how Facebook makes their money? They sell your eyeballs to advertisers. So all media, 
is potentially distraction, it's all potentially very good and a form of traction if it's what you say you're going to do. So I, I you know, we, we need to get off of this like, oh, it's addicting everybody, it's melting our brains, it's stealing our attention. It's not stealing your attention. You're giving them your attention. You're willfully giving it over. Oh, but it's so engaging and I like it so much. And the algorithms are melting my brain. Give me a break. <laughs> <laughs> right? Like, unless you're pathologically addicted, and some people are, right? Some people have obsessive compulsive disorder. Some people have addictive disorders. It's about three to 5% of the population. So that means there's a 95 to 97% chance that ain't you. What is happening is not that we're getting addicted. What's happening is that we are getting distracted. But we don't like using that terminology because if I say I'm addicted, that means that somebody else is doing it to me, right? Mark Zuckerberg is doing it to me, right? Uh, but of course, it's not true, right? The vast majority of us, it's a choice. It's a distraction. And the beautiful thing is that if we want to, if we stop believing this stupid lie that we're somehow incapable of taking back control, if we believe we can do something about it, we will. But if we keep telling people as you know, the, the, the traditional media keeps telling people how addicted we are, guess what people do? Nothing, <laughs> right? Because what happens? It's called learned helplessness, right? If you believe there's nothing to be done, you don't do anything about it. Whereas what I'm trying to fight is to empower people to realize, look, we can get the best out of these tools without letting them get the best of us. Yeah, but but Nur, I, I'm trouble. I'm conflicted, I guess, with this a little bit. And, and you and I work with technologists because we're thinking about how do we scale, right? How do we grow the users and all that? And along the way comes a lot of cost. Though you talk about, I mean, social media is one that's easy to because a lot of people can resonate with that and hear it in the news, uh, as you had said, um, you know, with. Well, there's the good side. There's also the bad side of, you know, like TikTok challenges where people are doing all these crazy things. The choke challenge where someone actually died. There's, uh, you know, endless well, comparison how, for young girls. But this is, you know, we're talking about puny numbers. How many people have died from a TikTok challenge? What are we talking about? <laughs> it's, it's, and, and how many people die? You know, we know if you look at teenagers, okay, on every conceivable metric, Teenagers are living longer, more responsible lives. How can that be? How can that be? Teenagers, they're all addicted. They're brainless, right? They're all like, all their brains are con controlled by these technologies. Listen, if you, so if you look at the statistics and I, I'm not familiar with worldwide, I'm familiar more with the United States, teen pregnancy, record lows, truancy, record lows, drunk driving, record lows, smoking, record lows, uh, drug use other than cannabis because it's become legalized, record lows, uh, homicide, record lows. This was the generation of the super predators. There are, do you know that there are hundreds of prisons, juvenile detention centers that were built in the United States of America that are empty. They had to shut them down because the teen crime never happened. We, everybody expected the, demogra the, the demographers all expected a crime wave of super predators. It didn't happen. You know why? Because if you wanted to invent a device to keep kids off the streets and safe at home, maybe this little thing is not a bad idea. So if we're going to blame technology for all these bad things, there is one area, right? I'm not naive here. I've seen the research. There is one area that has gotten worse, and that is teen suicide, because around 2008, it was at a record low. So from the 90s, it was very high. It dipped to a record low, and now it's creeping back up, which is terrible. We need to figure out why. And I'll tell you why. The why is not the technology itself. It's what the technology is displacing. It is displacing the most important element for your mental health which is sleep, sleep. So anything that beeps, buzzes, or boops should not be in a child's bedroom. And if we help children get the rest they need, partially that's by helping them get to bed on time. Partially it's because these stupid schools make kids wake up at five in the morning to get to school on time, which is ridiculous, right? Uh, we, we need to reform a system that actually understands how kids' brains work and that kids are not meant to get up at five or six in the morning. Uh, which is part of the reason, by the way, I homeschool because we couldn't change that part of the system. But let me tell you, my daughter does not sleep with any technology in her room. I don't sleep with any technology in my room either because I know how important sleep is. And so this is a big, big factor. It's not the social media itself per se. It's what it's coming at the expense of. Now, is there, are there people out there who overuse? Of course, we call those people addicted. We, you know, three to 5% of the population. Uh, are the people who, who overuse and abuse? Of course, we all do. But we have to stop blaming and shaming and saying that it's all these external factors where for some people it is, but that's a very small percentage. So if you're not a child and if you're not pathologically addicted, guess what? 
again, back to where we started the conversation, not your fault. You didn't invent Facebook. You didn't invent TikTok. You didn't invent the iPhone, but it is your responsibility. Because let me ask you, who's going to do something about it, right? The problem, I wish, we, I wish we would have gotten off this topic a long time ago, because here's the thing, Sarah, the vast majority of the people listening to this conversation, if you're out there building product, I promise you, your pro- problem almost 100% of the time is not that people are overusing. Nobody's addicted to SaaS software, right? Nobody's <laughs> addicted to your, your, your cool little app that helps people save money or exercise or whatever. I wish it was that easy. I wish I could get people addicted with these amazing techniques that I talk about in my book, Hooked, to exercise and saving money and learning new languages. If that was the case, we'd all be millionaires with six-pack abs and we'd all speak seven languages. It's really hard to, consumer, to change consumer behavior. So the real problem out there for the vast majority of businesses is not that anybody's getting addicted to your product. It's that nobody gives a shit about your product, right? That you've designed a product that people should use because it would improve their lives, but they're just not using the product. Yeah, and, and let's give, in, in the time that we have, let's give a little bit of a teaser here on, on what this looks like. How do you get users hooked to the technology, that you, the products that you're putting out there? Yeah. So there's basically four basic steps to the hook model. One is triggers. So we talked about with the indistractable model, internal and external triggers, same two triggers. We can use them for good by figuring out where the pain is in users' lives, right? Every product you use, every product, doesn't matter online, offline, enterprise, consumer web, doesn't matter. Every product is used for only one reason. That one reason is to modulate your mood. That's it. The only reason we use everything, every product and service, the food we eat, the the television we watch, the products we buy, everything is to make us feel different. So if you can understand how people feel and how they want to feel, you can begin to build a habit forming product by identifying that internal trigger. Okay. Then of course, what external trigger prompts them to action. Then the action phase, the simplest phase, the simplest action done anticipation of reward. And this is all about making the product as easy as possible, decreasing friction until they get the reward. The reward phase is the third step of the hook model. And it always involves some kind of intermittent reinforcement, some kind of variable reward, some kind of mystery that gives people what they came for that scratches their itch and yet leaves them wanting more. And then finally, the investment phase, and this is the most kind of unique part of the hook model and separates it from other, you know, habits, personal habits, like what James Clear talks about that, you know, more personally directed. This is really specific for products. Habit forming products must get better with use. They have to improve. They have to uh, appreciate as opposed to depreciate with wear and tear. And there's many different forms of investment. This is probably the most overlooked part of the hook model. And the most powerful is that you have to build a product that improves with use. It's called what I call stored value. And I teach you exactly how to do that. And it's through successive cycles through these hooks. This is how eventually a habit forming product doesn't even require an external trigger. Eventually, the more the person, the, the user uses the product, uh, the more they don't even need external prompting. They don't need spammy messages. They don't need uh, expensive marketing ads. They start using the product on their own because of an internal trigger, not an external trigger. And that's how through successive cycles through these hooks, this is how our preferences are shaped and how these habits are formed. And I, I'm just curious because I, I know you use a ton of case studies of how this works. Which is your favorite? Which company do you think has really nailed it in the head with this framework? Ooh, that's a tough one. So uh, there's lots, uh, there's lots and lots of examples. Um, so uh, in the second edition of the book, um, so the first edition of the book, I was, um, uh, you know, we can't do controlled experiments in the social sciences. It's very hard to have a randomized controlled trial, especially with companies. You can't say, okay, one company is the hook model, one company can't use the hook model. Let's see which one wins. So I had to do a lot of conjecture to say, okay, look, I think I see this pattern in all these various products. But then with the second edition of the book, I had some case studies of companies who had used the hook model from scratch. And that was super satisfying. So in the second edition of the book, uh, I I highlight a company called Fitbod. And Fitbod, uh, a friend of mine had sent me this app after I had written an article. I was so frustrated with how bad the fitness industry was with all these fitness apps, you know, the, the track your calories and walk 10,000 steps and, you know, wear this pedometer. And I'm just so frustrated at how poorly designed from a behavioral aspects. So many of these apps were that I wrote an article that was called why your fitness app is making you fat. And a friend saw this article and said, Hey, look, I read your article, but you've got to try this app. It's really good. So I downloaded this app, Fitbod. 
I don't have any connection with the company, by the way. Uh, I, and uh, I started using the product. And as soon as I started using it for a bit, I wrote the, uh, the, the company, you know, they had this little, you know, contact us button in the app. And I wrote this company, I said, Hey, uh, have you by chance read the book hooked, uh, signed near Ayal? And within 30 seconds, I get an email back from the CEO. It says, yes, we read your book and we actually designed the hook model into this app. And it shows, it's so well designed. And in fact, I've been using this the, the FitBod app for years now, and I attribute it to why I'm finally in shape. You know, I mentioned I have six, a six pack abs for the first time in my life <laughs> because of, of this wonderful habit forming product that does such a great job of, of, now I can't, I honestly, I can't go to the gym without it. It's such a valuable product. And again, I don't, I don't, I'm not, I don't have any shares. I wish I had shares. I didn't because of ethical duties. I didn't want people to think that I'm, you know, promoting it for, for monetary reasons. I promote it because it used the hook model, still uses the hook model. The, the company is doing incredibly well and people are really benefiting from it, which is the most important thing. Love it. Love it. Well, you are hooked and I want to honor the time block that you gave us here. So I'm going to end there with uh, billion dollar questions, rapid fire, so that we know a little bit sure. about how this person has come to be. First question, money or power? Uh, power. Fame or fortune? Fame or fortune? <laughs> uh, that's that's a tricky one. I would say, I would say fortune. Fortune. So we know to-do lists don't keep you up at night. What keeps you up at night still? <laughs> what keeps me up at night? Uh, earworms. <laughs> Sometimes earworms. I get a song stuck in my head and then I wake up and I can't stop singing the song. Uh, and I actually learned there's a, there's a great solution to this in that e e this is, this is brilliant. Somebody taught me this and it works like a charm. When you have a song stuck in your head, the best thing you can do is chew gum because the, oh. ryth the rhythm of your mouth conflicts with the rhythm of the song in your head. But the problem is at night when I'm awake, I can't do that. <laughs> so I recently started you doing breathing keep... exercises. <laughs> or you got to keep gum at the side. I don't know what your wife will do. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but then I'm afraid I'll choke on it in the middle of the night or something. But yeah, there, there, okay. there are some things that I, I, I don't, I, I, you know, typically I, I don't have too much of a problem because uh, uh, I actually talk about this in the book about how I, I fought my own insomnia. So if I'm, I do wake up almost every night, but I, I usually fall asleep within 10, 15 minutes. No, oh, that's good. A moment you felt like you were giving up. Well, to be honest, you know, I, I started two companies and uh, I felt like giving up all the time. <laughs> it was really, really hard. Uh, and thankfully, you know, uh, the first company was successfully acquired by a private equity firm. So that that was great. The second company was not quite as successful. Um, it was basically an aqua hire. But yeah, I mean, running a company, uh, I, I mean, this is this is why I think, you know, entrepreneurs are such a special breed. It sounds glamorous. It sounds fantastic. It's really hard. So I was thinking about giving up all the time. <laughs> <laughs> and well, you know, this leads me to the next question. What would you tell your younger self? I would tell my younger self that it's all prom. What does that mean? It's all prom. So uh, in the United States, we have this big, like, thing at the end of high school called prom, which is like a big dance. And for some reason, we have teenagers dress up in formal wear with like uh, boutonnieres and um, cummerbunds and it's ridiculous. But anyway, it's such a big deal, especially in the United States. I grew up in Central Florida and like prom was like a really big deal. And like, who are you going to go with? And what are you going to do afterwards? And how are you going to get there? It was like such a big deal. And then of course, now I look back, it's, it's ridiculous. Like who cares? But at the time, it was such a big deal. And you know what? Everything in life is prom, right? It looks like such a big deal in the moment, uh, especially the things that you really want to go well, but yeah, it's just prom, <laughs> right? That at the end of the day, yeah. uh, we are a tiny blue dot, as Carl Sagan said, this tiny blue marble in a huge vacuum of a black universe. And um, don't take things so seriously, right? It's not, yeah. by the way, this is advice I still repeat to myself every day because it's very hard not to take a lot of things very, very seriously, especially things that are really hard to deal with in life, right? When, when life's worst problems encounter us. What I try and remind myself is, you know, this too shall pass. The good shall pass and the bad shall pass. Absolutely. Uh, what is, this is, uh, you know, I'm really curious about this. What is your guilty pleasure? My guilty pleasure? Uh, I do like chocolate. I'm a big chocolate fan. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I really like uh, dark chocolate. <laughs> Love it. And uh, you talked about your daughter. What are the three key 
uh, values that you want your daughter to espouse moving forward? Uh, so for her, okay, the three key values, um, I think, you know, one of the reasons that we homeschool is that I think it's very important to be an autodidact. So if, if values are attributes of the person you want to become, I want her to be a person who teaches herself an autodidact. I think that's the most important skill that we can teach our kids because, you know, we, we have no idea, you know, lifespans are, inc are increasing. Uh, we're all going to go through several careers in our lifetime, probably. And so the most important thing is not to have one skill that, you know, the, the kind of school system that, that we typically go through, which is, you know, built for the industrial uh, revolution age, not for our current age, the information age. So I think that's very important is to have this skill of, um, of, of t being able to teach yourself. I think uh, integrity is incredibly important. That's a value that, that I want her to know. Uh, to, to be honest, to never be a hypocrite, and to, to practice what you preach. Uh, and then finally, I think uh, having a sense of humor is a, is a wonderful value. Because not everything should be taken seriously. I love that. And this is a exactly. last one uh, before I let you go here to, to be a, I think it'll be an excellent teaser for your books. Bing, chat GPT. Are people hooked to Google that they will never move over to Bing? <laughs> So the only way they're going to, so there's four ways to uh, change, uh, to, to capture an existing com customer's habit. Uh, if, if somebody owns that habit, there's only four ways and it's a longer discussion about those four ways. But one of the four ways is to make a product that's way better in the reward phase. So we talked about the four phases of the hook model. So the third step is the reward phase. And what studies have found is that the product can't just be better. It has to be nine times better to break that inertia of a habit. Okay, so you know this is why nobody compares and sees it as being actually better than Google. And we actually know that when we take side by side comparisons, when people do third party studies and they strip out the branding of Google versus Bing, people can't do the tell the two apart. It's a 50 50 preference split, and yet Google has what 90 percent of the search uh, market. Um, so the only way that Bing is going to capture market share is if the product is way better than what Google offers. Now. Google, that, that could happen, but I will tell you, I think uh, Google's not stupid, right? They're running like crazy to match, if not exceed the features uh, that, that Bing is going to get with ChatGPT. So in the absence, like if there was a, you know, this is what uh, Clayton Christensen's disruptive innovation is all about, is when the, the incumbent can't compete on the same level, right? So the, the upstart comes with a disruptive technology that the, the incumbent just can't copy because it would ruin its business model. That happens every once in a while, it happens all the time. But in this case, I don't think that's the case with Google. I think they can integrate chat GPT-like features. Well, you know, uh, uh, you know, they're not going to call it chat GPT. Obviously, that's uh, OpenAI's product that they're doing it uh, with Bing. But uh, they have to respond in a way that makes that uh, that that gives them a competitive uh, offering. If they don't, and maybe there's something I'm not seeing about why it would erode their margins, you might be able to argue, well, they can't show ads because if it's a chat interface, then they won't be able to show certain ads. But I would actually argue that that's actually um, that's that's not that's already being done, right? Like when you search for something on Google, if it's just a question, they'll just show you the answer, right? Like what date is the Super Bowl? It used to be it would take you to a website and that company would make money on that traffic. Well, no more, right? If you say what day is the Super Bowl, it'll just tell you the answer. So that's already been happening. Uh, so I don't think that uh, Google is going to sit still. If they did sit still, if they're what you know in a vacuum, if they didn't do anything, yeah, I think Bing could change that consumer habit. But given that Google is going to run very, very quickly to match any kind of features that that Bing and OpenAI might roll out, I would not bet against Google. Ooh, love it. Well, a lot yet to be seen, but therefore a lot more call for your work. So everybody can get your book anywhere on Amazon. Is there anywhere else you want to, where can they find you other than your website? Is there any other prompt sure. you want to share here? Yeah. So again, my website nearandfar.com is uh, where you can find my latest articles and uh, my book, Indistractable, How to Control Your Attention and Choose Your Life, as well as Hooked, How to Build Habit-Forming Products. Love it. Thank you, Nir. And I hope to see you in Singapore. Sounds great. Can't wait. And thanks so much for tuning in this week. You can subscribe wherever you get your podcasts and follow our socials on Sarah Chen Global to get the latest on the show. It would really help me out too if you enjoyed this to rate and review our show on Apple Podcasts and share your favorite episodes with a friend. I'm Sarah Chen Spellings and you've been listening to Bill and Dollar Moves.